be done. Amen. So this morning we're in uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 5. We looked at uh, 3 through 5 last week. But I want to talk to uh, us about the last couple of words in this section. Uh, the word of God. Jesus was uh, tempted by Satan, and Satan used the word of God. And at one point, Jesus told Satan, Man shall not live by bread alone, but he shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word in the Bible is important. And we're going to look at one of the most important words for the church, for us, that's in the New Testament. And I will say at the beginning that our sinful nature is not going to like this sermon. It's not going to like it at all. Because God asked the people in his church to do things that the sinful nature doesn't want to do. Uh, relationships with people are one of the most difficult things in life. When people like us, it's easy to like them. And we have friends that like us. Uh, we don't have any friends that don't because if they don't like us, we kind of don't want to like them. Uh, it's hard. I keep telling myself that God can break a change in my life and in other people's life. If he can make a star that, that is, you know, millions of miles across one star that just keeps burning Every, you know, ever, it just keeps going and going and going. And if he can make billions of these things, even trillions of these stars, certainly he could change me to be something that he wants me to be. It's my sinful nature that's at war with my new nature. My, my sinful nature is at war with the Holy Spirit. It just does not want to conform and it never will. But we have a new nature under the power of God that can change everything. We can be different people. And that's who we want to be. Uh, one time I saw a man at the pulpit and he didn't speak English. So he had his missionary with him. The missionary came back on furlough and brought this man uh, from the country where he was ministering. He brought him with him and uh, to interpret. So the man that was before us was from uh, some country in Africa. And he was a, a real honest-to-goodness headhunter from a tribe of headhunters. And that's what he did. And he had personally murdered many, many people. Till this missionary went there with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And guess what? He got saved and he doesn't murder people anymore. <laughs> he gave that up. Isn't that a good thing? And you're watching a testimony of how God can change a person. He was the chief of the tribe. And the whole, you know, the, the tribe gets saved when the chief does. They all follow him. So what a glorious testimony that was. But the world holds sins, sins and, and behavior against us forever. You know, they say once a person is this kind of person, he can never change. And they're just convinced of that. But God is in the business of changing people. Uh, if any man be in Christ, he is a brand new creation, a brand new creature. All the old things I have passed away. They're dead. They're gone. New things have come. Like that one song said, we're risen with Christ. Now we're risen with the power of God within us to make us who God wants us to be. God does want us all to be different people than we were when we got saved. And he can do that. And he does that. And I know there's been things in my life that were very easy to change. Um, after a, a her, the most horrific, terrifying, bad LSD trip in the world, well, guess what? I've never taken that again. <laughs> and I've, I've had any, any drugs. I haven't done drugs anymore. And that, you know, it's been over 50 years. No problem there. And um, all, a lot of other sins in my life, they just were gone. But man, some of them have held on. I guess, you know, some of your favorite ones that don't cost you too much and usually ones that we can hide, they just seem to, they're, they're so tenacious, they're like an octopus and they just put the tentacles around us and the suction cups and the little hooks dig in and we feel like we're trapped. But God can change us. He can free us from these things. This last song we just sang, he set us free from the law of sin and death. 
The old things have passed away. So thank God. So the new nature is going to like this sermon a lot. Okay. So last week we looked at Romans 12, 3 through 5. The body of Christ. The church is a real group of people. It's the only true church there is. And it encompasses believers all around the world from all different denominations and practices and countries and languages and whatever. Nationalities, people all over the world. Anybody that trusts in Christ as their Savior can be saved. And is part, immediately a part of the body of Christ. So the body of Christ has many different parts and that's all us. So my body has fingers and fingernails and knuckles and joints and wrists and on and on and on, all the different parts. And inside there's parts and you want those to keep working right. We got kidneys and liver and heart and lungs and all these things and blood vessels going all over the place and all kinds of intestines all curled up. And all those parts make up the human body and they're all necessary for it to work properly. And we're learning that that's the way the church is all the different Christians and personality types and temperament types within the church and stages of Christian growth, it, it can all work together and that's what God wants. So once we're born again, we're born into the family of God. So today we're going to look at the members of the body of Christ. In Romans 12, 5, it says this. So we, though many, and how many believers are there? Well, there's millions and millions. We're one body in Christ. And individually, each individual person is a member one of another. So we're all members. A member is just something that is part of a body, a part of a bigger whole. And that's who we are. Uh, this word members uh, is in... 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We're all individuals. We all have different gifts. We all look different. We all have different personalities and temperaments and uh, abilities that God has given. Uh, we all have different maturity levels, uh, but we're all members of the same body. We all make up the one body of Christ. So in Ephesians 5.30, it says we are all members of his body. Ephesians 4.25, we are members one of another. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.15, don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? So now we know. Don't you know? Now we know. Okay. And so we are members of Christ and we are members one of another. One another. When I saw this word, I thought we got to have a message on the one another's. The one another's are a very big deal to God. And they should be a very big deal to us. We're all people. And in the words of that, uh, what was that guy named King? Can't we all just get along? And that would be the, should be the motto of every single church in the world. Can't we all just get along? Now, I have talked to people in this community that said, have told me, I will not go to that church because so-and-so is there. Now, I claim to be a member of the body, and that member of the body bugged me so much, I'm not going to be in the same room with that guy. Well, by the time we get to this message today, you're going to realize that's wrong. That's totally wrong. And God can overcome this. So we're going to head off into one another land. And we got a lot of one another's to go. So uh, this word, one another, it's used a hundred times in Scripture. We're not going to look at all of them. Aren't you glad about that? But we're going to look at a lot of them. Uh, this word shows us God's will for every believer in the church. One another, we're supposed to do this with one another. God desires it all have fellowship with God himself and with one another. God made the heavens and the earth. He made a round planet with all this water on it and all this air. And he made us that have lungs to breathe air and bodies that need water. And all the water grows the food and the sun makes the food grow. And we have the heat from the sun and, and all of the beautiful little 
stars in the sky that are enormous balls of fire. And if you got within, you know, uh, millions of miles of them, maybe you'll burn up. They're so bright and hot and everything. He made all this for man. He put human beings here. And it's all, everything is always all for his glory, to glorify him, to make him look good, to, to show how good he is and how awesome and magnificent. And to say, oh, glory and praise to God. He is so good. He put all these human beings here. And when he started out with the first two and Adam and Eve, it says that one day Adam and Eve were in their garden and they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And what was God doing? He was looking for them. And why was he looking for them? Because he wanted to talk with them. And it sounds here uh, like he did this every day. He would come and talk with the people that he made because he wanted them to love him and he, and he did love them. He made us with uh, mouths that can speak language and brains that can comprehend all of that. We can hear it and understand. We can understand him. And he gave us eyes and he gave us ears and all of our senses to sense God and everything that he made. I I'm made my people and I'm going to be with them. I love them. And I've given them all these wonderful senses to enjoy and partake of everything that I have made. That's what God wanted. He said, I finished my creation. And everything was very good. And then God is walking in the garden and Adam and Eve hear him. And God says, he calls out to the man and he says, where are you? And of course, Adam says, well, we were hiding because we realized we were naked and we didn't were naked and we were ashamed and on and on and on. Did you eat the fruit? No, I didn't. She did it and you did it and he did it and Satan did it and they're blaming everybody and from then on. And then this communication with God stopped. But God said, where are you? He was, wanted to keep talking with them. He wanted to keep fellowshipping with them. But they were hiding because they sinned. So after the first two chapters in the Bible, a whole rest of it until you get to the last two chapters. It's all about all the people out of a relationship with God and fighting against each other because now we all have a sin nature. And now it's hard for God to come and talk to us. People can't even talk or fellowship or communicate with him until they're saved. Everybody is born spiritually dead to God and we have no relationship with God until we get saved. And then we have a wonderful relationship with God. Then he actually comes and lives inside of us. And we can pray to him. And, and we can pray, what is the right thing to do? And God will show us the right thing. Different circumstances and inside. Oh, I have a peace. I, I know this is what God wants. Isn't that great? He said, this spirit inside of you is just a down payment. It's a guarantee that you're going to be with me someday talk with me and have fellowship with me and when we see the end of everything this uh wor new world order that's taking over the world and wrapping his tentacles around trying to shut everybody up that's good and tell us the truth and well, it only wants everybody to know its lies and he uh, thinks it will be able to stop everybody from buying and selling unless you belong to it. satan and the antichrist and the image unless you do it. they think they've got it locked up forever but they they got it locked up for seven years, mostly, and that's all they get. And after that, that seven-year tribulation when God is pouring his wrath out upon this earth, working with Israel, bringing them to the place where they recognize that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah. After that, there's a thousand years where Jesus Christ himself is reigning in Jerusalem, sitting on a throne in a temple. Oh, praise God. And we get to talk with him just like Adam and Eve did. Now he says, I, this is how I want it to always to be. And this is how it's going to always be. And no unsaved people or no demon or, or Satan is going to come in and mess it up ever again. They are condemned and locked up in the lake of fire and they will never leave that place. And now people that uh, know me, no Christ is their Savior. In Revelation 22, 3 and 4, 
it says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in this city, this new Jerusalem. And we are his servants, and we will get to worship him personally, in person. When we're singing, we're not going to be looking at a screen or a song leader in the front of the church. We're going to be looking at God himself, singing to him. They will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. Wow. In the tribulation, those that follow the Antichrist have a number on their forehead or on their right hand. We're going to have God's name on our, on our foreheads. That's what it says. I expect it to be there. And put it there. We get to fellowship with God, and that's the way he wants it. And he wants us to fellowship with one another. There'll be no infighting. There'll be no jealousy. There'll, there'll be no um, uh, hating of anybody in heaven. Heaven will be here on earth with the new Jerusalem. Uh, all those things will be th things of the past. They don't exist anymore. Everybody will be nice. Everybody will be nice to me, and I will be nice to everybody. Won't that be good? <laughs> It'll be so good, I, I just can't wait. <laughs> um, but during the time in between, we're not there yet, but this is what God wants for his church. If we look at uh, 1 John, where it stands out, John is talking, of course, about Jesus, about the word, the word that was made flesh. But he's talking about Jesus. And when Jesus was here on earth, He's saying, we were with him. We heard him. We saw him. We lived with him. We touched him. We had fellowship with him. So 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, that's Jesus, which we have heard, they heard him talk, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest. Jesus became a person. And we have seen it. And we testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which is with the Father and was made manifest to us. And that which we have seen and heard and proclaimed to also to you, to that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so now that your joy may be complete. And then in verse 7, it says, if we walk in the light, in, in the light of God's Spirit, illuminating all truth and all sin and everything in our lives, if we walk in the light as He is, God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. When we're God's Spirit, work in our hearts to express sin, to light it up, we're going to have fellowship with each other. And because we do sin against each other, the blood of Jesus, his son, will be cleansing us from all sin. Because people will come to me and say, that other believer sinned against me. And I don't want to like that other believer anymore. Well, the fact is that Jesus, his son, cleansed that believer from their sin. And, and it can cleanse you from your own sin of hating that other believer. When we talk about one another, we still are talking about sin. That's the times we live in. But the blood of Jesus Christ makes everything all different. It brings forgiveness. It brings washing. It brings cleansing. So this is the time we're living in. So now we want to look at this word, one another. Uh, three different points. Who are the one another? And how to be a one another. How to behave with one another. How do we get along with each other? And to do this, we're going to find out that we're going to talk about love a lot. Because Jesus says we have to love one another. And I want to take a moment to read 1 Corinthians 13 and remind us what love is. Oh my goodness. The sinful nature does not like this. It, love uh, cuts 
lost the sinful nature. The sinful nature is contrary to it. It's at war with it. But love is how God is. And this is how he wants us to behave. So 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. How important is love? If I speak hand of angel and have not love, I'm just a noisy gong and a clinging cymbal. Now, uh, a pastor and a, a, a teacher, an author, uh, wrote a book um, about how pastors and elders are to be. And then he had a, a message that I found online where he preached just about this. And every time he preached about love, and if we don't have love, how when you're talking, and if you don't have love, it's just like a clanging noise. And he would always bring with him, he said, this a very annoying noise. And he'd reach under the pulpit and bring out a pan and like a big spoon or something. And he would just walk around the room hitting it. Gang, gang, gang. And you're just like, okay, I get it. You know, stop. But he didn't. He just kept hitting it. And says, see how annoying it is? Yeah, it's annoying. We need to have love. Otherwise, annoying. And if I have prophetic powers, and if I understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, remember Hebrews 11, without faith it's impossible to please him? So I have so much faith, I could say one of these mountains be removed, and it would. But I have not love, I am nothing, a big nothing. You get the idea that love is everything. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver up even my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Now here's what love is. Somebody that is hard for you to like. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. And that is a biggie for Christians, for pastors. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It is not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. When, when somebody else does the wrong thing and falls and makes a fool of himself. It doesn't rejoice in that. God doesn't. But it rejoices with truth. Love bears things. People become unbearable. Well, it bears all the, th all the time, all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. For prophecies, they pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but I I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So every time we see an admonition, a commandment to love one another, think what we just read. So uh, who are the one another? Well, we'll cover this in a minute, under a minute. In Romans 12, 1, he addresses them and he says, brothers, it's to Christians. All Christians are one another's. Uh, in Romans 12, 6, he says, you are, Romans 1, 6, you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And in uh, Romans 1, 7, to all those in Rome, Paul writes, who are loved by God, and called to be saints. God calls us, we're saints, we belong to Jesus Christ, we are the one another's. The saved world is not. That belongs to us. So, uh, point number two, how do you uh, become 
one another. Well, you have to be born again. You have to be saved. And when you're saved, then you can be in this one another group. And uh, if we look at uh, Romans chapter 3, we talk about uh, how a person gets saved and what salvation is and why we need to be saved. If we look at uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. That's a human being. And all of us fall short of the glory of God. God's perfect standard, nobody could reach that. Uh, that's been described. Uh, God's glory is in Hawaii. And you're on the coast of California. And God said, to reach my glory, you got to take a running leap and leap up in the air and land on the sh coast of Hawaii. So um, a person in a wheelchair do it. person that's paralyzed can't do it or bedridden. Uh, a little kid, man, they can jump and they can get out a few feet. A world-class uh, run, hop, and skipping guy, you know how they do that. They can run a long jumper. They can get out a few more feet. Nobody is going to be able to make that whole distance. Uh, all have said, all have fallen short of the glory of God. But here's the good news. Here's the gospel. But we are justified by his grace as a gift. Salvation of Christ dying on the cross was a gift that God gave to us. The grace that he gave to us, we didn't deserve and we cannot earn. That's what grace is. It's only given to the people that cannot earn it. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Christ redeems us from our state of being lost and bound for hell. In verse 25, whom God put forward, who is the savior of the world? It's not Buddha, it's not Allah, it's not anybody else. It's not ourselves. God said, here comes the savior, and I'm going to put him right out there, and that's Jesus Christ himself. I'm putting him forward. And he is actually a propitiation. That means God says, I have to see Payment for sin. I have to see suffering for sin. Sin must be paid for. And you're going to have to pay for it for all eternity in hell. Every human being. But what I've done, I love you so much. I put my son, Jesus Christ, the sinless. Behold, the Lamb of God. The sinless, spotless one that has never sinned. Tempted in all points like we are. Never with one sin. I'm putting him out there to shed his blood. It's by his blood, it says here. And that sin uh, redemptive one is Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be saved. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, eternal life. If you want eternal life, it comes through him. And how do we partake of that? Do we show God that we're determined and that we're going to do a lot of things and promise him the world and we're going to serve him as Lord and we'll do this and that? No. The way you can receive that redemption that he satisfied God with. That's what salvation, he did the satisfying, he did the sacrificing, he did the offering of his own body, the shedding of his blood. The only way you can get that is to receive it by faith. He came into his own, the Jewish people, but they rejected him. Only those who received him, as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. You have to receive it by faith. And this was to show God's righteousness. It has to be by faith, through grace. God's Jesus is the offering. It's the spotlight on me as God. This is what the worthiness. I'm going to show you I'm worthy. I'm going to show you I'm tough and strong. And I, I should be saved because I mean business. If the spotlight's on us, you can't be saved. It has to be on Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. And that's what this is saying. So that's how we get saved. Through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Uh, we have a book back here on the shelf called 100 Times. The Bible says, believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Is that just believing that he existed? No, that's trusting in him as the Savior for your sin. That's what that is. A hundred times the Bible says it. The book of John says it was written for a purpose. 
that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing we might have life in his name. So that's how you become one another. So now that we're one another's, how do you behave? <laughs> ah, here we go. Uh, John chapter 15. Not even the church age. John, uh, Jesus is giving his commandment. John 15 verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another. And how much do we love one another? As I have loved you. Yeah. And how did he love us? Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. So before the church even begins on the day of Pentecost, Jesus wants his disciples to love one another. Uh, Romans speaks of this a lot. In Romans 12, uh, verse 10, it says to love one another with brotherly affection. Now that's assuming that the brothers love one another. But a close family affection is affectionate. Uh, Romans 12.10, outdo one another in showing honor. Wow. So if somebody shows me honor, I want to outdo them in showing honor back, not bringing honor to myself. Uh, Romans 12.16, live in harmony with one another. And, and I think of these uh, musical groups that we hear sing, uh, especially uh, some of them where the instruments aren't too predominant, and you can just hear their voices, and they're singing different parts, and the different parts all harmonize together. In the church, we should live in harmony where we all blend together and make one beautiful church. Romans uh, 13, 8, no one anything except to love each other. And Romans 14, 13, love, let us not, uh, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. So sometimes Christians like to pass judgment on other Christians. Sometimes we need to. Paul said, judge the man in Corinth that was living in sin with his stepmother. He said, I've judged him and I'm not even there. But no, he doesn't want us to be judging people that we shouldn't any longer. Um, Romans 14, 19. That's an interesting verse. It says, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbring, upbuilding. And we have to look at that a little more closely. To pursue is to chase after, to go after. Um, sometimes I get to see one of the cats catch a mouse or something. And they're pursuing it. They're going after it. And they're running and they got their hooks out and they're knocking it around and then they're going to bite it for a while. Of course, they keep playing with it and stuff. Kind of bad. But, um, but they're pursuing it. That word is actually used for persecution. When it says Paul persecuted the church, that's this word. He went after it. When he got saved, he was on the road. He had his little full of all these papers saying, I can arrest all these Christians. I'm pursuing them. Well, same way, God says, I want you to pursue. I want you to go after this. Don't be just stagnant and just sitting there after and what are we supposed to go after we're supposed to go after peace making peace with one another uh, 12 18 says as much as impossible with me that i'm to do my very best to make peace with the believers to bring peace between them between me and them between me and god go after making peace with each other and we're supposed to go after the mutual, and that's this word, one another. The upbuilding of one another. We're to be builders. When you uh, drive to Reno on USA Parkway, 
uh, every time I go there, there's something, another wall is up. They're just building all over the place. On, on one of the hills, way at the end of it, when you're getting close to the freeway, up on that hill, there's all these big, heavy earth machines, and they're getting rid of all the rocks. They're going to level it, I guess, and make a place to, up there. Every place, all these machines go in, and they lay this groundwork, and it takes months for them to get rid of all the rocks and make all the ground suitable to pour a concrete pad on. Then they start pouring the pads on that, and then they raise them up as the walls, and all the walls are going up, and then the roof goes on. It's building, and as Christians, we don't want to go in and tear them all down. And that's what Christians tend to do. They, we tend to tear each other down. Maybe that makes us look better. It really doesn't. It makes us look like building busters. <laughs> We're busting destroying people instead of building them up. The whole church is all about building us up because God is building us up. God takes some of us from the depths of sin and just builds us up. And uh, as the Bible says, the more sins you've been forgiven, the more you tend to love God. Who was the, the lady that was first at the tomb to, to embalm Jesus? And when she finally saw Jesus, who was the one that he had to say, please let go of my feet. I, I got to ascend back up into heaven and I can't do it with you grabbing hold of my feet like you are. She didn't want to let him go. It was Mary Magdalene, a prostitute, had seven demons. He cast the demons out and saved her from a life of prostitution. And she was the first one that wanted to find Jesus. When, when she saw the tomb was empty, she asked the gardener, where have you taken him? I've got to find him. I love him. He, he changed my whole life. My life is now because of him. You know, the God of Jesus. <laughs> We're supposed to build people up. God builds us up. He doesn't want to keep tearing us down. He wants us to keep changing, to keep being more like him. And sometimes it seems so impossible. God has stopped me from doing sins that after so many years, I thought they would stop. That I would never be able to, to, to have victory over. And much to the dismay of a, of a person who was the head of a Christian recovery group, I did a recovery group. How did I do it? By the Holy Spirit happens to live inside of me. That's how I did it. He did it. Yes, he did it. <laughs> and he says, well, I don't believe it. I said, well, that's not my problem. <laughs> I'll tell you how I used to be and how I am now. Uh, I don't ride in the back seat of police cars anymore, handcuffed. Now I get to ride in the front seat and ride along. My friend in Tahoe took me on a ride along and he scared me to death. It was middle of winter and icy roads. And when we got out of the parking lot of the police station, I was looking at all the other police cars parked like that. I was looking them all straight on, but we were going this way. We we're going sideways. And I said, Jeff, you got to slow down. You're scaring me. <laughs> and, then, and then he went, got a call and he went closely down in the place. And this is dark. We're in the night and all the roads are icy. And he turns the lights out. I said, you know what the street where we're going? And he says, oh, I know. I don't worry about it. Okay. But I liked being able, and that meant a lot, to drive in the front of a police car <laughs> and not in the back. God changes people. Let him do that. He wants us to upbuild people. Uh, this word, uh, upbuilding, in, in 1 Corinthians 4, 3, 5, 12, and 26, it said all the gifts are for the building up of the church, the people in the church. In 2 Corinthians 10, 8, uh, Paul says he's there to build them up, not destroying them. He doesn't destroy. He comes to build, make better, make a big, beautiful building. Uh, for your upbuilding, brothers, scripture after scripture, uh, building up for not tearing down, 2 Corinthians 13.10 and Ephesians 4.12. Uh, pastors and teachers are given to equip the saints in the church for the work of doing all the ministries of the church, for the building up of the body of Christ. Uh, Ephesians 4, 
9, let no corrupting talk. And that word corrupting is a very smelly word. It's the word that the Greeks used for rotting fish. And these beautiful Tahoe trails I walk on. In the spring, you walk down and you get off of Marlette Dam and it walks down and the water coming out of the dam. There's this big, beautiful waterfall right in front of you. And then there's big pools of water with all these little fish in it. And, and I took pictures of them. And, but, you know, as the year went on and the water in the lake got lower, the waterfall stopped and all those pools turned into dead, rotting fish. And you could smell it before you got there. You could smell it as you were walking away. And that's one very important reason we need to pay attention why God put your smelly nose right next to your mouth that eats. Because you're putting something in your mouth and it doesn't smell right, don't eat it. <laughs> well, the words that we say to people can be like stinky, rotting, f corrupted fish. When, when people hear the words, they, they're just like, oh, please, let me, come on. <laughs> you know, don't be that cruel to me. Let no corrupt talk even come out of your mouths, but such as is only good for building somebody up. As it fits the occasion, then it may give grace to everybody who hears. In Romans uh, 5, 15, 5, may the God of endurance and encouragement. God has all the endurance. God has all the encouragement. Encouragement. So he's the one that's going to help us. May he grant to you. This is a good prayer. May he grant to you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that to give you may with one voice glorify God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, therefore welcome one another, just as Jesus Christ has welcomed us, all for the glory of God. You see how everybody is getting along? And it's always in comparison to what God has done for us. We can instruct one another, and we, we can, we can do that. Listen to one another when we're being instructed. Uh, Greet one another with a holy kiss. I must say, in all of being in churches, that has happened one time. And, uh, and it kind of shocked me. Uh, I guess uh, it seemed kind of weird to me. But somebody just came up and kissed me on the cheek. Uh, it was a real pretty girl, so that was okay. But uh, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, and 1 Peter, it says the same thing. Greet one another with a holy kiss. That is really loving each other. There's nothing uh, immoral or sexual about that at all. Greet one another with, it's a, what kind of kiss is it? It's holy. It's right. It's good. It's separate unto God. And that's very affectionate. That's very kind. And you tend not to greet people that you don't get along with like that. But that's what God tells us. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And 1 Corinthians 12, 25, that there may be no division in the body. The body is divided. If it's missing a limb, it's going to have a hard time operating. All the pieces need to be together, not divided. But as the members may have the same care for one another, we're supposed to care for one another. If one member suffers going to suffer with that when, when somebody's going through something real hard and we're praying for them and every time you think about them your heart goes out to them again and you pray God help that person um, I, I think something too it, it's okay to give people advice but a lot of times when somebody's really suffering something it's good to say I really feel for you and not try to tell them what to do uh, I don't know, that, that takes some balance there, but it's always not the best. If somebody's suffering, suffer with them. Uh, I know how you feel. Or I can't imagine how you feel. That has got to be so hard for you. You know, weep with those that weep. Don't start admonishing them, telling them what they need to do. When we love one another, when we care for one another, that's what God wants. If somebody is rejoicing, rejoice with them. Be happy and glad with them. Uh, something happened great in their life, uh, be happy with them. We're all together in one body. 
And then Galatians 5.13, through love, serve one another. We're serving each other. Usually our sinful nature wants to be served, but we're to serve one another. Uh, Let me take a moment to read this verse. Uh, This is so lifelike. This is so true to life. It is in life. Um, Galatians 5.13. How we're to be. So you were called freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite... (laughs) Christians biting, dogs biting. (laughs) If you bite, then devour one another. Watch out that you aren't consumed by one another. I have a book with that title in it. That that Christians will tend to just keep biting each other. And after a while, the whole church is empty because everybody bit each other to death and swallowed each other up and they're all gone. Nobody wants to go there anymore. Be careful that you're not consumed by each other, Paul says. He's saying, love one another, it's your neighbor. That's what God always keeps telling us. Uh, Galatians 5.26, we're not to be conceited. We're not to provoke one another. Think brothers and sisters. (laughs) Growing up, they provoke one another. We're not to do that. We're not to envy one another. Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens and so forth. The law of Christ. In Ephesians 4 2, we're to bear with one another. And how do we do that? It has to be in love. Christian agape love. Ephesians 4 25, put away falsehood and speak the truth with his neighbor. For all members, there's that word that's used in Romans, members one of another. Don't lie to each other. Uh, Ephesians 4 32, be kind to one another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So, understanding how God feels about me. Uh, sometimes children cannot be grateful for their parents. Sometimes they can say, I hate you. Uh, sometimes children can say, I hate living there. And that makes you feel really hurt really does. But then you say, well, I'm going to love you anyway. Whatever. Because sometimes you say, I do like you. <laughs> but I'm going to love you anyway. And, and when, when I would encounter this sometimes, it would hurt so bad. And I would pray to God for things to change. And I felt like God said to me, now you know how I feel. When I try to love everybody and everybody hates me. The whole world hates him, except the believers. Now we know how God feels. God says, I have forgiven you. Think of all that I've forgiven you. And what has that other person done to you that's more than you've done to me? Forgive one another as I forgave you. Uh, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's right before the passage of wives submitting to your husbands. It says, each believer, one another, is submitting to each other. Our sinful nature doesn't like that, but our new nature does. Philippians 2, 3. Uh, this is a really powerful passage because it's, it's talking about Jesus came to earth. This is his love and how it is. He gave up his throne in heaven and came here and became a person. And he was obedient to God, even to the point of dying, even dying on a cross. And it says we're to have the attitude that he had. So it says in Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfish ambition. And I think we all have ambition. We, we want to be ambitious and get accolades for ourselves. We want people to like us. We want people to look up to us. Selfish ambition. We're not to be conceited. But here's how we're supposed to be. Real strong word. But don't do this, but do this. In humility, which means low, 
themselves lower than the other person. And humility counts others as more significant than myself. And that's really hard to do because we live in a world of I am one. And God says in the world that God looks at, God says, if you say you're number one, you're going to be last. And if you're last, I'm going to make you first. And I want you to magnify others, build others up, make other people look better than yourself. Been trying to teach the kids that. Make them look better than you. No, I want to be better than them. I am better than them. Well, no, try to make them look better than you. There's no comprehension of that. That's why we have to keep learning it. And within myself, in a lot of ways, there's no comprehension of that either. I want people to really like me. Uh, I, you know, I'm in this little pastor's group, and I don't want to be the best. I want all them to be magnified. I want all them to look better. When somebody asks me about one of them and, and their church or what they believe or something, um, I'm, I'm never going to say anything negative about anything. I want them to say that they're a great man of God. They're a great preacher. Go there. It's great. I want other people to look better than myself. That's what we're told to do. Count each other as more significant than yourself. Uh, Colossians 3.9, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self and the new self, which is created in the image of God. Colossians 3.13, bear with one another. And we that means some people are unbearable. We're supposed to bear with them anyway. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, and sometimes we do have legitimate complaints against another person, the way they're treating us, what are we supposed to do? Forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. In, there's, in the Gospels, there's that passage. Of the uh, Well, first of all, uh, Matthew 18 is where it is, verse 21 and 22. Peter says, often will my brother sin against me? Okay, my brother is sinning against me. How often do I forgive him? Well, and the rabbis and all them said three times. That's all you got to give him three times and that's it. No more forgiveness for him. So Peter went beyond that and said seven times. And the Lord says, no. Seven times 70, 490 times. What he's saying is you always forgive them. And then he went on and told the story of the man that owed millions of dollars. And, and the king came and said, pay up the money or I'm going to put your family in prison and you and make you pay the rest of your life. And the guy said, please have mercy on me. And the king said, okay. And had mercy on him. I forgive you for your all your millions. I forgive you for your debt. You're free and clear. You're not going to. And then that man went out and found some man that owed him a dollar. And he said, you pay me that dollar. And the man said, I can't. And he said, okay, I'm going to throw your family in prison. And, 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 you know, hold you accountable the rest of your life to you. Pay me that money back. And the king came to that man and said, how dare you? You owed millions and I forgave them all. And this guy owed you a buck and you put his family in prison. And uh, I think he killed him. So... How many times do we forgive people that just keep against us? It, it's unlimited because God keeps forgiving us. Because Christ died for forgiveness. And that's the thing that, that makes it all clear. How much do you forgive? Well, God says the same that I gave you, forgiveness that I gave to you. And then 1 Thessalonians 3.12. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another, all the more. Your loving, keep abounding, keep increasing, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Because he is coming again. In the very next chapter, he talks about the catching away of the church, known as the rapture, for those who hate that word. <laughs> but he gives, you're going to catch us away. Have your heart clean before God when he comes. Increase and abound in your love with one another because God at some point is going to catch us out of this world and you won't have a chance anymore 
to forgive or to love. Now you approach the judgment seat of Christ. This is the only time we have to have rewards is right here. So keep increasing. God is open. Keep increasing. Keep growing. Uh, First Th- uh, Thessalonians 4, 9. You yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. He loves us. We, he teaches us. Um, uh, First Thessalonians 4, 18. Talking about the rapturo, the Latin word for catching away. Um, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encouragement of the Lord will take us out of this world. And and even if we die as believers, we'll be resurrected at that time. There are new resurrected bodies. And the fact that we are not going through the tribulation, that we're being saved from the wrath of God in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another with those words. Because we see the kind of government and religion that the tribulation describes as being assembled right now. It is. The whole world is going to be under the control of you cannot buy or sell without a mark. And the whole world is being enveloped with satellite system that can be reached from anywhere in the entire world. Elon Musk is putting them up for us. That's real nice. If you live out in the country and can't get the internet, you can use his um, internet. But he's encompassing the whole world. The whole world, the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, the the UN, the World Health Organization, all of these things all say we are going to not want to, we are going to a digital ID and a digital dollar and it's coming to America as well. The whole world is to do this. We see these things happen and the worst of it will be in the tribulation. So encourage each other. We won't be here. We're going to be taken away before that happens. The worst of it. The mark of the beast. We will not be here. That's three and a half of the tribulation. Encourage one another. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.15 See that no one repays anyone evil for evil. But seek. And that's that word persecute, but go after, seek to do good to one another and to everybody. Do good to everyone. In 1 Thessalonians 1.3, the love of every one of you for one another is increasing, Paul said of the Thessalonians. He said, I can see it. And that's what he wants in a healthy growing church is for the love of everyone to be increasing. Hebrews 10.24, consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. How do we encourage to, to stimulate each other to love one another and to do good works? James 4.11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. James 5.9, do not grumble against anyone's brothers so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And James 5.16, Therefore, confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. You see, the body is all together. Praying, confessing, bearing with one another. We're all joined together. First, 22. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. First Peter 4.9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So hospitality, uh, inviting people over, and when the people do come over, don't grumble. I've experienced that in my own life. When someone came to stay with us for a few weeks, and uh, they were just always there, and all the things they had to do, they, they were always there, and they always wanted to talk and everything. and. And, uh, and then after a few weeks, they left. And the next year, they came again. And I, I was thinking, I'm grumbling. I was thinking, oh, man, <laughs> got to go through this again. Love one another. <laughs> Don't grumble against each other. Uh, let the sinful nature go be dead. First Peter 5.5, 5, clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. Everybody's higher. Humility means low. I want everybody to be higher than me. 
For God opposes the proud person, but he gives grace to the humble person. Oh, God is opposed to the proud person. 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His son cleanses us from all sin because there's always sin involved. Blood cleanses us. 1 John 3, 23, And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. So to end all, all of the one another's. By the way, in the book of Revelation, the word one another is used two times. And neither time is it used of the church. And why does Paul talk about one another, one another, all the time the church is here, all these letters and epistles with instructions to the church? Why is there no instructions to the church in the book of Revelation? Because it's in heaven. It's not here anymore. Just one more thing. So, used twice in the tribulation in Revelation 6, 4. The red horse comes, taking peace from the earth, and everybody is slaying one another. That's what's going to happen. And slain was the word they used when they chopped the animal up in pieces and made it for the animal sacrifices. Slain one another. That's what's going to happen. Revelation eleven ten. when the two prophets of God are killed by the Antichrist. The whole world makes merry and rejoices over them and they exchange in presence with one another. <laughs> so it's used two bad times in the book of Revelation, not for the church. And now to, to conclude with First uh, John chapter 3. Very, well, take the words for what they say, because they mean what they say. And I've wondered about this. I've wondered about this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother righteous. You see, the evil people like to kill the righteous ones. And do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Now listen to this. In verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he, Christ, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If anyone has this world goods and sees his brother in need, and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word. Oh, I'm praying for you. <laughs> but let us, but, but uh, in talk, <laughs> talking to the person, oh, I feel for you, and I know you're going through hard times. Let us act in deed and in truth. Indeed, have a financial need, help them. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. When the church started, the wealthy people sold some of their land and to provide for the poor people. And then uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. The words, I, I just pray that God will give me clarity when I think about people uh, in my past. Uh, it says in verse 19, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, oh, I love God and I hate my brother, he's a liar. He doesn't love God at all because he hates his brother for whom God died and God loves and is a one another. 
If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So the conclusion of this all, in this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 